there are just some things in this universe that we interact with that are great carriers of intention and prayer and music tends to be one of the more more potent potent of them you know and, the, and traditionalists like um my Cherokee teacher used to say for every moment especially in ceremony there is a rhythm there is a pulse there is a song and if you can find that rhythm pulse and song you amp up and intensify the healing and transformative potential of that moment. So here we are on the Weird Music Podcast. We've got Jeff Firewalker Schmidt from Saint Disruption. We're going to talk about new music Saint Disruption has coming out. Super glad to have you on here, Jeff. Uh, for all you out there listening, Jeff is a, a renaissance man of, of sorts. You're well-versed in martial arts. You went to Oxford. You have multiple degrees in science. I read you were running a research lab when you were 15. I've been at science for a while. That was kind of like one of my first passions, and it certainly uh, helped keep me out of trouble as a young, and I was a bit of a, a redneck, hellion, rebellious kind of kid. And, and um, I just had lots of you know, really good teachers and guides when I was young to keep me out of trouble. And so science was one of the first things I did, but also music was a, an early, early passion as well. Yeah. So you've got science, you've got music and, and Jeff, you're also a medicine man of sorts. Is this correct? Yeah. I was trained in a couple of different traditions. One hailing from the highlands of, of Peru and then another from the, the Northern regions of Peru. I'm a, I'm a Huachumero. Um, I work with the South American cousin of peyote and um, um, have been, you know, sort of officiating ceremonies with that in places in countries where it's legal for 15, 20 years. And then I'm also a Tabak here. I work with sacred tobacco as a, uh, as an agent of healing, as a sacred sacrament, and then was trained in that tradition as well. And, you know, in my science life, I actually did quite a bit of neuroscience research and helped found a company based on our neuroscience discoveries, based on um, the very fascinating way that tobacco and nicotine interacts with uh, the nervous system, quite unlike any other any other plant that's ever been discovered. Wow, I find I find this so interesting. Like the the traditions of healing in different tribal communities. I'd love to hear the story of how how you originally became initiated into that tradition. I know uh, it's very special circumstances um, that one would be taken in to something like that. I'd, I'd love to hear how that went down. You probably heard this before. It's something that you never choose. You know, you don't wake up one day and go, hey, I think I'm going to be a curandero or a medicine person. It's, 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 you know, partially because, because it is a spirit sanctioned uh, life transition. You know, spirit comes out and grabs you and says, this is what you're to do next. And um, it's also something that you don't choose because the training in many of these traditions is absolutely harrowing and, and takes you know, a very, very long time and a lot, a tremendous amount of, of sacrifice. It was nothing planned. I was, I was working, um, building a research institute here in North Carolina and, um, and just a very bizarre turn of events led me to being introduced to, uh, the, the, a curandero who would then become my first maestro and my first teacher who I sat with and studied with for seven years. And then I went to uh, Peru a few times and then started working with with his teachers and um, the first time I sat in one of these traditional ceremonies for the first time in my life I felt like I was home really truly home and I was seeing things you know after the ceremony I was describing to my then teacher what I had seen in the ceremony and he was like who who the hell are you kid how did you see that and um and I knew what was about to happen in the ceremony. It was very strange. Um, and it wasn't a, a week didn't pass, not more than a week passed before I asked him to be my teacher. And one, one day the medicine came to me and said, okay, I have shown you what's possible, what, where you can, I've shown you your destination. Now I'm going to make you work for it. And um, it took me 
probably 10 years to get up back up to the point of where those first few uh, encounters with the medicines led me to in terms of perception. The medicine said, okay, this is what's possible, but you got to work for it, son. So um, it was certainly nothing that was planned and it's resulted in, you know, I have a perfect life in so many ways. You know, I've got, you know, so many beautiful experiences, so many beautiful friends all throughout the world. You know, we work closely with our teachers down in South America. We take groups down there and then we bring our teachers up here. And it's just, we've woven a really nice spiritual family. I'm, out of this has come um, my nonprofit, which is called the Eagle Condor Council. We're one of the largest organizations um, in in the eastern part of America that supports uh, advocacy and training in the um, transpersonal and, for lack of a better term, shamanic healing arts. Jeff, I just recently read a book, The Teachings of Don Juan um, by Carlos Castaneda. And this book, like, blew my socks off. It explains experiences that uh, Carlos Castaneda has with a shaman named Don Juan. Mm -hmm. Don Juan facilitates spirit choosing Carlos Axis, Carlos guide to becoming connected to the unseen world. It in a really mystical way explains the r amazing spiritual inner workings of reality or at least theories of them. Uh, Jeff, I'd love to hear insights and, and what your take is on kind of the unseen world and really just how, how reality works and, and how your experiences with, with plant medicines have shaped that. Well, I can't pretend to have any understanding of how this whole big crazy machine works, but, um, but certainly those Castaneda works have been the inspiration over the last, you know, I, don't, I think they were written like 40 years ago now, um, for so many people, um, you know, opening up for many um, for the first time, the whole idea of transpersonal um, um, experience and, and reality, that there is actually something beyond the materialist dialectic. Um, so, you know, that's really, I think that's really at the heart of what we're talking about is that in, in westernized um, mental models, models of how the, how the universe works, we have come to a place of, of pretty much abject materialism um, where we, where we believe that, that everything, all phenomenon arise from matter, from materiality. So, so, um, so matter preceding consciousness. And this is, this is a sort of a, an argument that has been part of, you know, philosophy since the, the dawn of modern science is, is does essence um, precede substance or is it the other way around? Um, there are many traditional models of healing philosophies of life from around the world that say that it's actually consciousness, the spirit that actually precedes form, that precedes matter. Um, from traditional Chinese medicine to, to um, Amazonian shamanism, that's, that is sort of understood. Now, since, since the dawn of, of what we refer to as modern science, um, that equation has sort of been flipped in the West. You know, we tend to believe that everything, including our conscious existence, is somehow the product of just a, a complex computer that sits between our ears. Um, and there are a lot of problems with that argument. And, you know, and one of the, one of the, most direct challenges to that model, to the fragility, if you will, of that model is when a person first experiences a traditional medicine work or a visionary plant or, or, you know, eats mushrooms at a rock concert, you know, it's like, because these, these, these sacraments have been with humans since the beginning of time and their role is to help the organisms that that consume the sacrament to make sure that their mental models and understanding of how the universe works aren't embedded in a particular um, rigid viewpoint and, and in our case um, not we don't stay embedded in a in a materialist a reductionist materialist 
model of the universe. So um, that's a very long-winded answer to your question, I think. <laughs> so what is the unseen world? How would you describe the way your schema is of that? This is a very interesting question. And, you know, it's, um, it is really truly a matter whether you're a, whether you're practicing, um, you know, Tibetan Buddhism or training with the plants down in the jungle, these facilities, these ways of interacting with the, the essence of other than self, that which is other than self is all trainable. It's nothing mystical and woo woo and magical. Um, this is a, this is a point that I, I try to make to my, my students when I first start working with them is that, is that traditional healing modalities, the, the work of the village elder to see beyond the veil so that the, the interconnected web of life is managed more elegantly, those faculties are trainable. You, there are practices within mystery schools, within esoteric, um, eso, you know, eso, the esoteric aspect of religious practices and healing traditions throughout the world that teach you how to actually have spiritual sight to be able to use your hands as diagnostic tools. It's um, so seeing this idea of seeing across the veil, interacting um, with, with um, things that are beyond our Western physical understanding of the physical universe is not a bunch of mystical woo. It's a sci These are sciences in every way that, Western science is considered a science. It's just that it's dressed up in a different way and oftentimes looks pretty bizarre and exotic. But at the core, there is, um, with these systems, especially the ones that really, really work, there are methodologies that you practice and um, use to transform your, your um, bioenergetic system to so that you can actually accomplish these things, if that makes sense. Wow. And, and by accomplish these things, uh, you're referring to a type of spiritual sight? Yeah, for instance. So, so I remember the first time encountering uh, one of my, um, my teacher's teachers. Um, this was back in um, like 2008 when I went to, to stay with two great San Pedro maestros in, the, in, in northern Peru. They could look at a person 20 feet off, see him for the first time ever, and read off their whole life story down to like – they did it with a friend of mine and, and they were like, Oh, so um, I see you had, ex did you have exploratory abdominal surgery when you were 18? I mean, like not just, you know, your parents were divorced, weren't they? No, this is like very specific stuff. The diagnostic capabilities, incredible, all on the foundation of, of, very specific practices, which we teach in our mystery school. Um, this idea too, that, that, you know, part of, part of the skill set that we're talking about is also being able to interact with time differently because, you know, traditional communities and, and people that are in, in these sorts of practices understand that the arrow of time is not as rigid as we are conditioned to believe that one, this is, this is the key to ancestral healing. If this didn't exist and ancestral healing would not, would not exist. The ability to move through time independent of the, of the restraints of the, of the fit of physical systems is quite possible, quite trainable. And, um, it's 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 un understood by by people that are you know practiced by people who are walking on this planet now. I remember when I was um, with the sequoias in the northern Amazon. And I sought them out with a friend of mine who had been living with them because they had, were reputed to have one of the deepest understandings of plant consciousness and plant medicine on the planet. And I wasn't there but two days, sitting in a hut with two of the elders and one elder looked at the other and said, you know, we haven't been to the third star system in the Pleiades in a while. I kind of miss our friends there. Can we go there tomorrow night? And I was like, what? Only to discover a few days later that, that the Sequoia had this entire layer of 
the universe that they can access that we don't have any access to. They leave their bodies and go to this place and all their education happens in this space. They even bring in their hunting dogs into this space and teach them how to hunt. It's where they go to the council of all the other animals in, 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 um, in, in the jungle and draw up their trees. They have treaties with the wild boar. They have trees with the jaguar. You know, it's, I felt like a Neanderthal. I, I was, I was brought to tears by these people every day because I was like, Oh my God, you know, I, our enculturation has cut off 90% of my connect, my potential, my connection to the universe. I was, I felt like a, I felt, I felt so, it was amazingly transformative um, because, you know, we, through our education and through the conquistador energy, you know, we, we have culturally a very deep and twisted um, view, an unfortunate view of indigenous culture that somehow we're so much more advanced than them. And I learned early on that, that that is anything but the case. And as a matter of fact, you know, many of these cultures, these peoples hold the solutions to making humanity sustainable and balanced and resilient and healthy. And we're, and with impunity, we are just wiping them off the face of the planet, you know? So it's a very interesting situation we find ourselves in. And Jeff, my mind is blown hearing you um, unravel your experiences. I'm, I, I'm caught by, how you mentioned uh, traveling through time. Can, can you kind of explain that? Um, so if maybe like my younger cousin who, who's like 11 were listening, he could understand. Sure. Sure. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to talk about the World Wide web because, because there's an example of this that has emerged from the World Wide web um, that is extremely interesting and really fascinating. I, I, and I'll try to remember the name of the researcher that, that did this work. Um, so as pretext, I want to just say something. I am an absolutely huge fan of the World Wide Web. Because in a sense, if you think about biomimicry, how we as a planetary organism are mimicking the natural processes of evolution. You know, one could actually think about the world, the laying down of the World Wide Web as being the, the seeding, the establishment of re reflexive self-consciousness on the physical planetary level. You can hold up this thing in your hand and query the whole planet. That's really friggin' wild. That's so cool. But the challenge isn't the World Wide Web. The challenge is that the interfaces we're making don't have built in them the conscious directive of health, wellness, and illumination. You know, that's the, the issue isn't the World Wide Web. The issue is the interfaces that we're building. So anyway, this guy got access to a number of major data highway nodes around the planet, like where all the, you know, like from where all the data from that's going between the US and Europe go back and forth. He got access to those switching stations and ask a simple question. And that question was, in a given day, how many times do I see a specific word being used? And he just counted, he had a set of, you know, a few thousand words, I think it was. And he just counted, how many times do you see that word coming through in the traffic? house, car, fire, you know, whatever. And he was counting the words. What he discovered was this. This is so wild. When there are major global events, especially catastrophes, what you would see is an, before the event happened, you would see an uptick in the use of words that are connected to that particular event or catastrophe before the event happened. So for instance, the, the example that he had was of the, the tsunami that happened in Southeast Asia 12 years ago or so. Bef if you look at the counting of words before the event, there was a very appreciable uptick in words having to do with floods, tsunami, water, you know, everything having to do with like storms, everything connected to that you could connect to the tsunami before it happened. 
And then after it happened, of course, a lot of, a lot of use of those words and then after a while it trails off. What does this mean in terms of this arrow of time? This web, this World Wide Web is working essentially at an interface between materiality and non-materiality, right? Between what you might consider the newosphere, Teilhard de Chardin's idea of the collective field of knowledge and information exchange on the planet. So if you think about physical time being like my arm, like a, like a straight line and the, a big event happening here, imagine the big event is like dropping a pebble on this one dimensional body of water. The wave propagates forward in time and backwards in time. And the only reason that we're able to catch it on the web is because the web is sitting at an interface between materiality and a, and a different realm of, of planetary consciousness that we, we don't usually access in the, in the Western world. Now, this is how, I mean, this is how native elders since time immemorial kept tabs on what's happening in other places of the earth. You know, this is, this is like part of, you know, for instance, in the Andes, it's understood that there is this worldwide, the original World Wide Web, they call the Seke system, which is a self-organizing network of information and energy conduits that connect temples, play, uh, earth features of, of spiritual significance, et cetera, et cetera. And it said that that at one time was the original World Wide Web. That was how this kind of information flowed. And this information flowed in a way that didn't necessar wasn't necessarily constrained to the arrow of time. So that's an example. I'm not sure if it's an example for a, your 11-year-old cousin, but <laughs> it's an example that really shows in, in a really non-woo-woo way that these phenomenon are actually measurable. That, that time is not... You know, and, and, and in modern in modern physics, especially um, especially non-local um, uh, so-called non-local events and and interconnection in the universe that that arose from from um, quantum mechanics, um, things are not as, as quite as linear and constrained as they might seem, especially when you're trained and culturated and your body is attuned to a Western reductionist material, materialist dialectic. Wow. Jeff, I want to bring this back. You mentioned how harrowing it can be experiencing plant medicine, especially um, for the first time or in at the beginning stages of that. It can be really intimidating and scary. I'd love to hear any insights you can share with us on fear. Uh, and really looking it in the eye. Well, there's an old there's an old Cherokee saying that says fear is the arrow that points in the direction you need to go. Um, and you know, there's another teaching that says there is no initiation without a scar. And one might say that at this level of conscious evolution on the planet right now, that our biggest learning, our biggest true evolution and healing and transformation very rarely happens without some suffering and some some sacrifice and it's it's what joseph campbell contextualized as the hero's journey and the importance whether it's a plant medicine or going to a vipassana retreat or um, of you know doing a Native American vision quest that's well held, the importance of saying yes to the uncertainty, to saying yes in the face of danger, you know this this is this is part of our inheritance, and it's part of what's been kind of like stripped out of our inheritance, the rite of passage, the necessary understanding that to evolve, Parts of us that don't work in an evolutionary sense anymore need to die. And that that death is necessarily painful. And that there are means 
through ritual and ceremony that help people move through this. You know, um, Gene Houston uh, years ago postulated that the that the teen suicide rate in America um, is generally so high because our culture is missing these rites of passage, these these transitions. And it just happens that our visionary uh, plant medicines are often very much attuned to um, this being part of our uh, birthright, part of a necessary part of our evolution. And oftentimes will trigger especially in the early days, if you've only, you know, if you're only, you know, starting to experience um, visionary, these visionary teachers is that they will accelerate and put, you know, help you step into these, these um, transformative processes. And they can be extremely harrowing, extremely scary because, because um, again, there is this oftentimes this necessary uh, element of, of, letting go of the former self, which is often extremely, extremely painful. It is, it is a, is a, it is a, it is a death in essence. Um, and again, it is, I think it's important to reflect that throughout human history, this kind of way of growing and being and relating and holding in a, in a, in cultural coherence is our birthright. It is the norm, you know, what we're living in in the Western world right now, you know, what I'm sitting here in front of sometimes a few hours a day, compared to the, you know, the way humans have been on the planet and behaved and lived and believed on the planet, is this is a freak show, man. We're living in a freak show. We tend to think it's normal because we don't know anything else. But good lord, you know, not only from the perspective of abject, insane consumption is this a freak show, but from the from the narrowness of our worldview. I mean, it's, it's very, very different than we've lived on the planet for the majority of history. And so when these initiatory opportunities come, when the first, when you get that impulse, oh, I'm going to go sit with an Iowa scarrow, you know, the likelihood is, you know, for most of us, you know, mortals, you can get your ass whooped. You know, it's tough because it's, it's, you know, like one of my teachers jokes and says, yeah, medicine work five years of therapy in five hours. It's no joke, man. It, you, you know, there's this, these visionary plant teachers hold in them the evolutionary imperative. They understand why humans are here and their job, if, if they're respected and, and, and worked within a traditional way, their, their job is to show up and help us fulfill that, that evolutionary imperative. Mm. And so a lot of the work you do uh, as a healer is, is to really keep that, that flame burning. Uh, Jeff, I, I want to direct this to tobacco. You mentioned um, it has really interesting qualities of protecting the brain, uh, but beyond that, you use it um, to heal. Can you help me understand what exactly tobacco does to the brain? Oh, man. So I'll tell you a story of origin. And this really illuminates why grandfather is so special and unique upon this planet. In the, in the early days after the minting of the earth, Pachamama, the world creator who's known as Pachacaymac in the Andes was um, hitting the point of his schedule where he was to give all of the newly minted plant people there their assignments, what would they do on the earth? And young tobacco was at the very end of the line, but young tobacco had really, really good hearing. And so as plants came up to Pachacaymac one by one and had their counsel about what they would do on the earth, young tobacco heard every single discussion and, you know, faced with all of the possibilities, young tobacco got more and more excited. Wow, there's so much to do. How cool is this? So by the time the line dwindled down and it was just young tobacco sitting at the foot of Pachacaymac, the only thing, because he was so excited, so beside himself, that came out of his, out of his mouth was, I just want to do what all of those guys just said that they want to do. And Pachacaymac was like, hmm, we don't have a plant like that. So be it. Now, fast forward to modern neuroscience. 
when you bring tobacco into your body, especially via the smoked form, either consciously or unconsciously, you can tell the tobacco what you want. It can be so many different plants. It can be so many illicit, like a more than a dozen different, as a, they're referred to in, in, in neuroscience, neuropsychopharmacologies. It can be a memory enhancer, a euphoria, an aphrodisiac, uh, appetite suppressant, um, an anxiolytic. I mean, it, it does all these different things. And the important thing and the wild thing is you tell it what you want, either consciously or unconsciously. This is one of the reasons why it, um, unhealthy bonding patterns that people tend to call addictions are so potent with this plant because it goes right to the core of the circuitry in your brain that connects to consciousness. This is, and it's also a really friendly plant. It's a, it's a friend of all the other plants. So if you become friends in a traditional sense with grandfather tobacco, he will, he will teach you about all the other plants. And so this is why, one of the reasons why tobacco is used with so many other traditional visionary medicines, and they work very closely together. You know, Grandma Ayahuasca and Grandfather Tobacco, um, Grandfather San Pedro and Grandfather Tobacco, et cetera, et cetera. You know, tobacco is, you know, considered in places where it grows naturally or, um, around the world as oftentimes as the most advanced of all of the uh, sacred plant teachers. And the big teaching in Western industrialized culture really is misuse a powerful tool and you're going to have some pretty bad consequences. You know, give a, give, you know, just imagine giving a bunch of like revved up chainsaws to kindergartners. It's, you're not, it's, the outcome's not going to be pretty, right? So this is where we are. This is the teaching. Grandfather Tobacco is an emblem of how easy it is to not understand the true nature of things. I want to know about the do's and don'ts of proper tobacco consumption. People, we have people, people smoke American spirits. Um, some, I have friends of mine that don't smoke uh, who, who would probably be very interested in, in experiencing this without smoking. Can you just kind of enlighten us on, on how you s have learned the right way uh, to use tobacco? I, I don't think I can enlighten you, but I can share my, my experience and, and what I've been taught. Um, so first and foremost, one is never walking in right relation with a teacher, whether it's a plant or a human, if you're using it. Think about how deeply our language informs reality. You know, I'm very, very specific and very cautious when I relate my relationship with grandfather tobacco. I consider tobacco as a sacrament, as a privilege, as a teacher, no different than the Dalai Lama, than Gandhi, than the Buddha himself. They just, the, the consciousness binds to the plant in a different way than to um, than the, the spirit matter interaction with mammals. But grandfather tobacco, grandmother ayahuasca, et cetera, et cetera, are no different than, than, than these great teachers that have walked the earth. Right relation is, a, is first and foremost about having the humility to put oneself at the feet in the circle of a person that understands these things and can hold a container that provides this different context and, a, and, a, and, and creates a coherence that allows the spirit of the medicine to express itself. If you're not working in a, in a ceremonial traditional context, it's not guaranteed that the benevolent intelligence of the medicine is going gonna, is gonna to be there. And that goes for peyote, it goes for iboga, it goes for all of the visionary and healing medicines. It goes for, you know, ma mama mugwort. The idea of, of sacrament, 
that you're holding in your hand, not a tool, not something that you bought at the store, but rather a, a piece of a part of the, of the, the body of Christ, the body of Pachamama that's, that has 50,000, 100,000 years of profound intelligence, who's walked with humans since the dawn of time. That consciousness, that reverence, that humility is, is really the only path to working with and being a student of and an emissary for these great teachers. Everything else is just really propagating, you know, propagating the problem. Um, if that makes sense. I know it sounds, it might sound hard. Yeah, so, I'm a traditionalist in that, in that respect. Yeah. So for a layman using tobacco on their own, not using tobacco for a layman. How, so how would I phrase that? Well, so, so here's, here's, here's a simple idea. This is what I often will recommend uh, to people that are seeking to change their relationship is to bring yourself into that beginner's mind. You know, when you were a kid, when I was a kid, I remember that the universe all around me was conscious and living. I had conversations with nature. I didn't have the indoctrination of, of belief that took me out of a living universe. That's the starting point. Can you bring yourself to a place where you, for a moment, suspend all of your indoctrination, all of your enculturation, and really feel and believe that what you're holding in your hand is living conscious sacrament. And if you can do that, then you can pray in a, in a really good way. Grandfather, I've not met you yet in a good way, but I am here humbly to meet you. I ask for this insight. I ask for understanding how I can pave a road that allows me to walk in right relationship with you. Grandfather, if it is virtuous, may I see you, may I feel you, may I know you now. And then you bring the medicine into your body and don't take it into your lungs if you're smoking. Hold it in your mouth and pray. And then after you're done, Sit and listen. Open, open yourself and surrender. And then after you're done, go out to Pachamama, go out to the earth and give an offering. Thank you, Pachamama, for this opportunity. Thank you for, for the opportunity to have your son in my house, in my temple. Thank you for allowing me to take this ancient wisdom into my body. Thank you, Pachamama. And as a matter of fact, independent of working with the plants, just doing that on a daily basis will change your life. If you woke up every morning with some, with some sugar or cornmeal and went out to the earth and said, thank you for my life, thank you, and really meant it, man, I mean, this is what we're into in the West. We're always asking, asking, asking. I want this. I want that. And, only, and we only you know, sit at the altar when things get really crazy. But what if every day you know, each of us went to the earth and said, God, thank you. Thank you for all this food and all my relations. Thank you. I mean, that's as simple as that, really. Amen. Yeah. So um, I always recommend having it seek. If you really are serious about understanding plant consciousness and, and, and improving your life through these paths, you know, finding, calling in a teacher, you know, calling in a guide, but, but with whether it's whether it's a potato or tobacco, shifting the equation, bringing yourself into a place of wonderment, and asking the question, "What can I do for you? Who are you? What are you really?" And as you take that into your body, you open and expand and surrender instead of control and use and intend. You know, it's it's these are these are the distinctions in consciousness and, and approach that really distinguish the native, the native earth connected indigenous mind from the post industrial mind. Uh, 
I almost have chills processing this. Jeff, zooming out, jumping back to um, the goddess of music. What do you think specifically is going on in the brain where music can be spiritual he- spiritual healing? Let me rephrase my question differently. What do you think most musicians don't understand about the way music is truly affecting us? Mm, mm. These are really good good questions. I, I can't pretend to understand that much, but my experience tells me that everything that comes from me as an I you know self-identified embodied soul to something that's outside of me has the potential to carry prayer and intention. And some things do better than others. Um, I would find it hard to, to infuse a crowbar with prayers for healing and give it to you and expect it to be effective. But a breath of tobacco, a song, these things are understood by native communities as potent carriers of prayer, prasad, offerings, sacred offerings, are like sponges, cornmeal here in North America, um, sponges for prayer and intention. Music, I think, in my experience, has a, a very, you know, has all of that and the fact that it is primarily modulation and change of vibration over time. And, you know, we know from modern, you know, we, we know from modern science that in essence, even, even though things at the macroscopic physical level seem like they're, they're sitting still oftentimes and there's not much happening. When you look at the fine structure of the system, it's all vibration. And we know that, from studying vibration, whether it's in in optics or sound, that there's this thing called resonance, right? Where two things that have some similar qualities can come into um, similar vibrational behavior if the right energy is is brought into the system at the right time. And so um, in my experience, especially with sacred music, it's, 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 largely about the vibe, resonance and the vibrational signature. Now, we also know from experiments that have been done with enzymes, you know, enzymes are proteins that actually are, do work. You know, they're proteins that take one substance and turn it into another, or maybe take a substance and chew it up. Um, they're the worker bees of, of, of life, right? Well, people have done experiments with I think the last, the, the biggest study I saw was like somebody took like 20 or 25 different enzymes and they had them in t- different test tubes. And they asked the question, what do different sound frequencies, if anything, do to how well those little molecular machines work? Do they speed them up or slow them down? And so what they did was they, they, um, they using biochemical methods, they ask the question, do different sound frequencies enhance the, the strength of the, the, the little machine or do they turn it off? And what they found was that different audible sound frequencies had a variety, a wide variety of effect on, on these enzymes and how well the enzymes worked. So at a, at a basic like physiological level, there is the possibility that, that audible sound vibrations can affect your, your biochemistry. Um, and that only, you know, the possibility of the interaction only exponentiates when we think about brain activity and consciousness. Sitting here as a scientist, I can say with great certainty that I don't think anybody has any idea how, what's from the perspective of Western science, what's behind the healing power of a mantra or, or a sacred medicine song. I don't think we have any idea from the Western perspective. I think it's, just, it's, it's, it's part of the great exciting 
mystery of what's what's upon us. We we do know it works, and we do know that there is, like I said, physical some physical bases for these transmissions. Um, my sense, going back to that model of spirit, and, you know, essence preceding matter, is that is that there are just some things in this universe that we interact with that are great carriers of intention and prayer and music tends to be one of the more, more potent, potent of them. You know, and, the, and traditionalists like um, my Cherokee teacher used to say for every moment, especially in ceremony, there is a rhythm, there is a pulse, there is a song. And if you can find that rhythm, pulse and song, you amp up and intensify the, healing and transformative potential of that moment hmm. but it's a matter of the universe using this is this is what i find so interesting is that you know the way i was trained in sacred medicine song is that i don't sing the the medicines use me to sing i'm just basically an instrument through which the the, the medicine itself identifies the ideal vibrational flavor of that moment. So um, it's, it's, you know, training in the, it's, it's very much like an, a caro in, in, um, in ayahuasca um, circles. They're a little different with San Pedro, but basically you ask the plants to sing you. Wow. And, and you know, the, there are different types of rattles and stuff that are used and you actually can use the rattle and tobacco smoke to actually open a, a portal and to find the song on the other side of the portal and the song comes in and sings you. Yeah. Jeff, you're one of the coolest dudes I've ever gotten to talk to. This is, this is awesome. I wish, uh, I wish you lived down the road and I could uh, run over with some coffee and my guitar in the mornings. So bringing this, I want to bring this back to St. Disruption. We're talking about the immense power of music and, and what it does to us. So, I'm curious with the music you create, can you tell me about the importance of darkness? Oh yeah, man. That's so it's really what happened. What's happened with St. Disruption has been kind of like this strange miracle. It was never planned. Just like, just like everything in, in, in the world of the sacred, you know, it's just like you show up and you move with the energy. And when the pandemic started, my work completely disappeared because my work depends on being with people, you know, and I sat at my altar and I was like, okay, spirit, what, what do you want me to do? And strangest thing came through the, the message was, well, Jeff, your job is to go back to music and basically tell the story of everything that you've seen as a current era over the last three decades and you will be supported. And I was like, wow, that sounds really weird, but okay, let's give it a shot. And uh, John and I had met over a decade previous in the Amazon uh, he and his, his, his wife are profound medicine practitioners. And so we have had a you know friendship and a, and a bond around that for years and years. And we were just kind of like listening, waiting for an opportunity to work together. And, um, and I was called, speaking of darkness, to um, reach out to one of the pioneers of rap and hip hop. Um, Umar Ben Hassan from The Last Poets, just out of the blue. I was like, I've always loved their work. And I knew that they were really important in civil in the civil rights movement and were like some of the first people to put poetry to music and and create they created this kind of like framework for people to deal with darkness in a way that was compelling and and that allowed you to be in it. And I reached out to him and and we sort of became friends and struck up a conversation. He sent me a poem, which is the pain storm, what became the pain storms song. And it was, it was like really intense to even think about how could I do justice trying to put music to this autobiographical poem about child abuse? Oh my God. And I called up John. And I was like, John, I think I need some help on this dude. And he goes, Oh, I love the last poets. Let's do something. So, that was kind of like the start of this. It was like, you know, actually creating medicine from the darkness was the subject matter around dealing with how to do justice, some justice to um, 
you know, one of the greatest spoken word poets alive, you know, poem that he just gave a stranger essentially, you know, and we did it and he loved it. And John and I were like, well, this is kind of cool, you know? Um, and then we started attracting other medicine people in. And so it's like the way that John puts it is it's like spiritual music without being spiritual because it's our intention. Our intention is about bringing the medicine through in a felt sense without being overt, you know, without actually weaving it into the dialectic and the language and the structure, uh, uh, the, the, the words in, a, in an overt way. But the shared intention of, of transformation and illumination. That's kind of, and it's been pretty interesting um, how, you know, like Daytrian Johnson, the, the singer on, the, on, the, on our debut album, he's a reverend and he's a profoundly spiritual human being. And the way that we, to this day, write music is from the perspective of, of like, praying and meditating may this song be heard by somebody and give them some solace may this song let a person know that they're not alone you know and and so without you know getting a jangle of the guitar and going oh, i want to be a foil to your darkness make you feel good you know forget that that doesn't work you know how can we encode how can we encode through intention the music to be something other than what you hear on pop radio stations. Mm. And so there's a cover of John Lennon's, uh, is it Imagine with Warren it's Haynes cool. coming out? We're excited about that. Yeah. I mean, in that, a sense, that, that to date is our biggest, has been our biggest challenge and in a way our biggest accomplishment, you know, it took us like eight months of, of revision after revision, experiment after experiment. How can we do this and not mess it up? Not only that, but how can we maybe cast that message in a context that really helps people understand just how important those words were, you know, and that's our prayer. Um, and it's edgy, it's dark. I mean, um, we took the traditional form, the traditional musical form and kind of built some dissonance and some more tension into it to kind of reflect the tension and dissonance that's all around us right now. Um, it's kind of a, in a way, we see this kind of a, a call to action. You know, uh, our musical offering is a, is a call to action, to actually revisit all of those themes about that really take a hell of a lot of courage, imagining a world without possessions, imagining a world without borders between peoples. This is big stuff. It, it's, it is the stuff that that if we can face it with courage will allow us to transform in good ways so we're super excited we're hoping that the release will be like right around the beginning of march hmm. well jeff man this has been so cool to talk to you to get to know the context the really what's imbued within what is saint disruption just like mind blown man just thank you thank you for all that you do thank you for brother yeah thank you very strong very positive intention uh i look forward to continuing to learn from you jeff and for uh learning from from all that all that is around us and all all that is imbued within us as, as one might say yes beautiful brother likewise man look forward to more fun explorations with you thanks so all much right. Well, I'm Cam. This is a Weird Music Podcast, Saint Disruption. Check them out. Follow them. We'll have links in the description. Much love, everyone. Take care. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Hemp Relief CBD, SEM Tickets, Devil Wind Brewing, and Artillery Productions. We got links in the description below. Go check out all the awesome stuff they've got going on. And yeah, much love, everyone.